do this. Right, excellent. So, Jim, any um, anything, any comments about last week's lecture, St. B's? Um, any news or um, anything? Not offhand, can't think of anything at the moment. Okay, well, I'm so pleased we've been replaced by a face mask on the wall for Karen. Um, any news from you, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> Karen, Sorry, I was going to get my cutting there. Yes, I've got a cutting. Oh, uh, go on, give it. The give drones us a in Pompeii. Go on. Hang on. You can right. show it us. Oops. Shall I read it out? Let's have a look a little bit more of that image. We didn't. You only saw it for a second. Ah, nice. Uh, underground passages, a uh, yeah. giant suffering. Right. Yes. So it's saying that the network of ancient storm drains under Pompeii are in such good condition that they're going to put them to use again. There are nearly 500 metres of the drains which are big enough to hold a human and were little affected when the city was buried in AD 79. Experts have concluded that they are still in working order. Uh, the entrances were blocked but they've um, started clearing them and they're going to use it and it says the fact we can do this is testament to the excellent engineering skills at the time and it, when you go to barry they've got to rip up the uh, plumbing and um, sewage systems on a regular <laughs> basis so that says a lot doesn't it yeah yeah and i know you haven't even got any sewers underneath lantern major so what does that say <laughs> um talk, 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 thank you for that karen any other news did you read the notes I haven't had a chance to read the notes yet, Carl, but I will. Right. On, on talk, talking about talking about last week's lecture, actually, um, the the reaction I had was was absolute absolute horror with the way the archaeologists had treated um, this wonderful um, <coughs> set of human remains at St. Bees, um, and um, and obviously never to repeat um, that. And I think overall. Where you've got Otzi the Iceman, where they're still examining Otzi, Otzi the Iceman, and is a very good condition still. Um, what they do to St. Bees in the autopsy, if you haven't seen the video, is um, uh, something else. So, uh, talking about people falling through the cracks in sewers, Gillian. I just knew you were going to come to me. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a cutting, but I forgot to cut it out. Okay. And the other thing, I was thinking the other day that actually um, Caligula's boats on the lake, or that were found in the lake, we actually went there a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. And um, yeah, I can't remember that much about it apart from the food and the wine when we were there, but no, no news. What, what we are gonna, thanks for that. Um, what we are gonna say straight away is that they found a third boat on Lake, uh, under Lake Nimi um and the way the way we're going to do this today is is by referring to this publication um and when i showed everybody this on the tuesday skype class one of them said oh how am i going to be able to get a copy of this wonderful publication uh, by david um by david sear i said why don't i give you the isbn number and um and see if you can get a copy on the internet and um when he said, when he said, um, when he said, oh, the, the cheapest copy on, online is 250 quid, Michelle came in the room and said, right, I know exactly what I'm going to do with you tonight. She got the poisons ready. 250 quid for this. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. it'll be you, this, this'll, this'll be a good, good sort of digest <laughs> um, looking at um, where Caligula comes into all this and it helps us understand Caligula a little bit. Um, and then the the other thing that we're going to do is look at um, great excavations by John Romer. You can get hold of copies of this for about three or four quid. Um, it's a wonderful publication, and that this really helps us understand. Um, this understands the real background of the archaeology associated with these boats, two of them um, that were um, that were salvaged by um, the engineers of Mussolini. Um, between 1927 and 1931. Um, and if I, this was uh, Mussolini's Italy, right? Um, I would have a huge mansion house with my own little servants directing archaeological work. And then after 1944, I'd have been probably hung. 
So there you go. Um, so, Goff, any news from you, darling? Did you read the notes? Any news? Haven't read the news. I did have some cuttings, but I ran out of loo roll. So they came to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that St. B's lecture, excellent. I, I, I had no idea anything about that. It was, it was fantastic. Very, very good. And I appreciate you saying that. And uh, I, I, I had somebody saying, oh, it was absolutely dreadful. And I say, but the lecture was absolutely brilliant. And I just thought, that's good. Because the way the archaeologists treated the, the um, St. B's man and, and the way, way we examined it, yeah, that's what made the lecture great because there was a huge contrast. Thank you for that, Goff. Um, and if we can hear Keith, is Keith there? Right, obviously, Keith, Keith the man unto his own rules. So we'll leave Keith there. So. I, th I think I think where we need to start, we need to start with um, some images, um, and hopefully, as we share the screen, um, we're going to sh um, share this screen here, um, and hopefully, it's going to come up. Um, uh, we're not seeing anything yet, but it will come up. I can see Dennis. Dennis with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you yeah, can't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis, nice Dennis, you he's can't gone. say that. That's <laughs> terrible, Jim. Oh, that's that's really bad. <laughs> Who's that ugly one on the right? <laughs> that's Dennis. That's you. All <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. I just, <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> Right, so so that that is that is Dennis. <laughs> That's nothing to do with the lecture. Um, we we will we will get to the slides we need to use now. Hang on, right, bingo. This is a good place to start. And the, the and we've we've found out that there's no way of doing this lecture other than looking at the the boats on Lake Nemi, right? Um, on I've got to finish at half past twelve. Um, on Tuesday night, we started at half past seven. We were finished at um, quarter past um, quarter past ten. Um, I've got no intention of doing another forty-five minutes today because I've got to do the one in the afternoon. But this is why we've got to just focus on the, the boats to try and get an idea <coughs> of this man. So where where we need to go, and you can see on the little image on on the left there, you can see that we've got um, this guy who's Augustus, this guy who's Tiberius. And this guy, who's Caligula, and the one underneath is Claudius, and the one on the next um, sheet is going to be um, Nero. And it's rather interesting that we actually start a coin associated with Caligula. And I think the clues to who Caligula were uh, is very different than what the history tells us. And why I'm saying that is that um, Suetonius, who write, the Roman writer Suetonius, who writes about Caligula in about 100 years AD, really derides Caligula, right? I'm actually a fan of Caligula because um, I probably I know a little bit more than the, the average Joe in the streets to understand that Caligula wasn't a complete nut pot. Um, and it's also Cassius Dio, um, 200 years AD, um, 160 years after the death, more or less, of Caligula, more or less write, writes about um, Caligula being a nut job as well. But what we need to do is try and understand this guy. So what, if this is a coin of Caligula, why does it actually say Caesar Augustus Germanicus? He actually took his father's name. Um, Germanicus was actually his official title. Caligula is the name used in history. So the, the archaeological name is Germanicus. The historical name is Caligula. Caligula basically means little boot because his father Germanicus and, and who he loved very dearly, and they loved each other. His father was very well respected uh, as this great general. Um, took Caligula with him um, into um, the, the the field, um, and um, and he basically dressed up um, Caligula about the age of three in a Roman legionary outfit with a helmet and and all the rest of it. And he had these little boots, hence why um, Caligula was given the name Little, little Boot or Little Boots um, throughout the rest of his reign. 
Um, now, to, to paint, paint a picture of this individual, to really get into it, you just need some key facts. Um, Caligula inherited the throne from Tiberius. His relationship was with Tiberius was that Tiberius, um, that was his, um, that was his, that was, um, uh, I'll start again. Um, he was the stepson of, I'm screwing this up a minute, calm down. He was a great nephew of Tiberius. Um, he was a great uh, grandson of Augustus. Um, so there you go. He was a great nephew of Tiberius. So he wasn't the son of Tiberius, who was the emperor who reigned before him. But he was the great grandson of Augustus. So that sets him in. He's got a right to the claim of being the third emperor. He only reigns for um, just under four years. <coughs> he reigns for three years, 10 months, eight days, and about 12 hours. Now, that's what I've got here. Um, again, to give you an idea of, of the man, he, he reigned from uh, the 16th of March, AD 37, and he was assassinated by his own uh, guard uh, at the age of 28. Yeah, in, um, in the year AD 41 on the 24th of January. So these dates are really accurate for us. So it's great. To give you another idea, um, the, the father that loved him very dearly, um, Germanicus Caesar, um, who may have had a claim to the throne. Um, he was actually a, a, a nephew of Tiberius, Germanicus, but Germanicus was a great um, military leader. Germanicus, the father of Caligula, died. Um, in AD 19, when Caligula um, was, was only seven years old. So, and then, um, again, Caligula was going off the rails when his mother died um, in AD 33. So Caligula was oh, only in his 20s when his, when his mother died. His two brothers died as well. Um, Nero Caesar, um, AD 30, when um, Caligula was only 18 years old, his brother died. And his other brother Drusus, his other brother Drusus died when he was 21, um, in AD 33. So that leaves his three sisters, and this is where we go to the coin. Um, one of his sisters was um, known as Agrippina, the one on the left. Um, the other one in the middle, middle Drusilla, and the other one on the right, were, um, known as Julia. Now Agrippina is the is the second most famous person in this story, because Agrippina Junior the only sister to outlive Caligula, the only one of his relatives to outlive Caligula, um, Agrippina, went on to um, marry Claudius. And Ag Agrippina was actually then the mother um, with the coupling with Claudius of um, the, the, the extreme despot Nero. Um, so that the, this sort of gives you a painting of his background to try and understand who Caligula was before we can actually get into the archaeology at all. This coin itself, um, probably around um, something known as a Dupondus or somewhere around there. I don't know the exact um, uh, currency that this one is, but it was the size um, of around an old one pence piece, a little bit below that, just over the size of a two pence piece between um, an old one pence piece. Um, and these coins were originally uh, bronze and they would probably. Uh, buy you a couple of loaves of bread. So that paints the picture. SC um, is another clue to who Caligula was. SC basically means at the command or the permission of the Senate. So in other words, um, every single Roman emperor, even though you hear them as being despots, even though you hear them as being um, out of clinker, even though you hear them as being out of control, they were still there at the election of the Senate. The Senate the Senate agreed or disagreed the, what the emperor did, right? And if the senators all turned against you, they could depose you. So these weren't absolute despots. But then again, um, if, 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 the, if they didn't agree with the emperor, then the emperor could in turn bump off one or two of the senators. But that's the way it goes. Interesting enough, the, the, senates were, the senators were organized in political parties. Like we've got the Conservative Party today and like we've got the Labour Party today and the Liberal Democrats, they, they, it was divided into political parties. And there would be a political party for Germanicus, there'd be a political party for Tiberius, and, and so on and so on. So again, painting the picture and the platitudes to where we go. So uh, again, let's move on to another image. 
if we want to if we want to get the real idea of um, what Caligula looked like, this is an idea of what Caligula looked like. If I want to paint another nice painted picture, um, let's look at the positive and let's look at the negative. This is a Roman emperor who built who built a legionary fortress at Calais um, that could house approximately um, three or four Roman legions. So a Roman fortress that, that could accommodate 20,000 men. He had that built. He also had a navy built at Calais and Boulogne, right? He also built um, a new Roman road network. He also built several Roman aqueducts. He also built two huge palaces, um, one at the Palatine Hill in, in Rome. He also had, we're told, now we're told, we're told, three great barges built um, um, at Lake Diana, right? In Suetonius, and the writers tell us that um, he, he, um, he didn't invade Britain. Um, he, he got his soldiers to gather um, muscle shells on the beach. Um, he, um, he murdered hundreds of people. Um, the boats on Lake Nimi were not, um, were, a, were, were a sign of um, opulence, were a sign of garishness, were a sign. But, but when we look at all this, the senators agreed all this. The senators allowed Roman money to be paid out on all this. And for somebody who only reigned for under four years, what I've just mentioned, I know these were built by the, the every, everyday people, but he, but he used state money to create this, 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 this great new Rome. And to be honest with you, this great new Rome survived for just under another 400 years. So he wasn't this great despot. And I believe that he did invade Britain. Um, he did receive tribute of um, Adminius. Um, and he came back and he told his soldiers to collect shells off the beach, maybe, and so on and so on. But we're not going to do um, his invasion of Britain, but I do believe he actually achieved it before Claudius and the same type of achievement as Julius Caesar. But Suetonius, um, Suetonius um, very much derides him and says that it was just about collecting shells on the beach and Dio Cassius writes a similar thing. So again, this is what he looked like. This is the same man who's responsible for those activities on Lake Nimi. He may have not been directly responsible for building those barges, but for those interested in naval prowess, they will learn a great deal about that today. So nose, ears, nice, nice bit of hair. Um, and he didn't have um, the damnatio memorari, which is basically to raise his name. He was what, not one of these emperors who had his name erased. Um, he was not somebody whose statues were destroyed. He was not somebody whose um, architectural achievements were pulled down. His palace at the Palatine Hill, Rome itself, survived. It's still there today. His boats survived. They were there until 1944. The one, uh, the one under the waters of Lake Nevi is has just been found. Uh, the fortress, the, the, the fortress and the other achievements at Calais and so on, the road network um, and the aqueduct, one of them leading into Rome, is still there today. So this is somebody who reigned four years. He couldn't have been a despot as we, we hear him being referred to as. Um, so, again, moving on. Within those, within, uh, within those four years, um, again, we have statuary erected to him. And anything to do with Caligula is sought after. And it's very much sought after because um, I, get, um, I get this little booklet on a, a, a regular basis by Michael Trenary, the coin dealer. Um, and recently, Alan asked me and, and Peter to order some coins for them. And they were sort of, um, of some emperors that we could get coins for. But if you want to get a coin for Caligula, you can't get one because his coins are very much sought after. Not because he had the Domnatio Memorari, where, his, where everything was erased. He's very much a sought-after emperor. And the, the one thing about this bit of statuary, this bit of statuary where you can actually see um, the, the base plinth and you can see one of his legs and his body over, over human size, okay, exaggerated size, marble statue. This, this, this had been stolen from an archaeological site and was making its way to a dealer. Um, 
and it's only a, just a bit of a statue of Caligula. So he's still respected, but he's great derided, but his achievements are amazing. So this is the painting that I'm painting for you. Don't always believe what the Roman historians tell us, because um, one thing the Roman historian didn't tell us was about disease um, and lack of sanitation um, and poverty, right? Because it was a common day thing, right? They only told us about things that they wanted people to hear about. It's a bit like the news today. The only news that we're getting today is, is about one thing. We're not hearing about other things, right? And, and this, this, is, this is not new. This is what happened back then. Um, carrying on. This is the empire of Caligula. This is very much the empire that was still there 300 years later. 350 years later, it was it's starting to fall apart. 350 years later, by about the 390s, Rome had divided into two states. The Eastern Roman Empire, um, concentrated in Greece and Turkey, um, and the Western Roman Empire, concentrated from Italy all the way over to Britain. But if you think about it, the only thing to be added to this map for the Roman Empire would be Britain. The only thing to be added to it would be bits of Germanicus that haven't been conquered yet. Um, when you see Marcus Aurelius in his reign in about the 170s AD, and maybe Septimus Severus and so on. And then you look at this area here, this big gap here of Romania, that was eventually conquered. Little bits of Africa, and that was it. That was basically it. So this, this is what uh, Caligula inherited. And if he was, he was such a despot, if he didn't know what he was doing, like Nero, he would have lost control of his empire and it would have shrunk. And the world that we know as the Roman world today would have been very, very different. We carry on again. This is Lake Nimi. And for those that don't know where Lake Nimi is, thanks to preparation that we, that we um, undertook on um, Monday, um, are you seeing a screen that shows a map? No. no. Uh, a picture of a lake. That's yeah. why lake. I need, need to change my sharing on the screen and I need to reshare another screen. And it's this map here. If, if you look at this map, this is a Google Atlas, um, a Google Atlas map on, online. Um, and there is actually Rome itself. There's where Rome is to be found. Um, I'm just going to take a note of something a second. Um, and just south, just south, um, southeast of it is actually two big lakes. And this one down here is known as Lake Nimi. Basically, it's an old, um, it's an old volcano. It's an old caldera that is just um, no longer uh, active. Um, and this itself is Diana's mirror, the place of Diana's temple, the place of all those things that Virgil wrote about. Virgil wasn't writing in the reign of Caligula. Um, Virgil was writing about a hundred years before, but Virgil tells us of the terrible things that Lake Diana is known for. But he doesn't tell us about the three boats, the three barges, doesn't tell us about the two that we know about in history. It doesn't tell us the, about the one that we've found in recent archeology. span and then where we're going to go in a moment, we're going to go to my good old book, which is Great Excavations. The very word of the, the archaeologist John Romer, who's still alive. He lives on Sicily. Um, and because he made archaeology very popular in the 1980s, 1990s, and the 2000s, um, archaeology turned against him in Britain. So he decided to go to Sicily and concentrate on his other work. So a loss for British archaeology. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'd, I'd like to stop this screen. I would like to reshare. Um, and who, who's ever, there, there we go. I'd like to reshare again, if I can get the technology up. I got a technical problem in it, minutes. So we're gonna reshare another screen. And we're gonna go back to this link. And maybe it would be wise to show you one of these vessels. So if I may have a moment, and uh, if I can just uh, click on, click. 
Okay, it's not allowing me a minute, but oh, there we go. It's going to have something else. There we go. Underneath that lake, up until 1927, uh, uh, were three of these barges. Two were lifted. And I know you want me to enlarge that on the screen, but for some strange reason, it's not. Oh, there we go. We're going to, there we go. I got the little cursor. Look at that there. And let's give, a, let's give an idea of the size of this. 1927. They'd known about them since the Diving Bell ex Expeditions in 1827. They'd known about these since the 1400s. They knew about these from the writings of Suetonius, Dio Cassius. But what we do say is that these are true gems of archaeology indeed. The boats at Lake Nemi, in the very words of John Roma, in the very title of this chapter, it tells us boats of Nemi, 1927, 1944. Now, a bit of controversy before I give you any other information. <clears throat> after May 1944, after late March 1944, the boats in the aircraft hangars built to house those boats were no more. The lead line, the two lead line vessels, there was nothing left of them. In fact, all they could find in the two aircraft hangars were burnt charred remains. But I've already mentioned the lead. If the, if the two vessels were set alight in the aircraft hangars deliberately, with the lead still underneath them, lots of the timber would have survived because as the lead melted, the timbers would have sunk into the lead, um, would have been overtaken by a leaden mass, would have been sealed in the lead, and therefore would have had timbers surviving. There's a report in Rome that nothing survives except one or two timbers. It's likely that the American army or the German army stole all the lead and burnt the rest of the vessel as a cover story for the lead required in the war effort. But that is more for the later on in this lecture. I wanted to chuck that in straight away to get you thinking. Ashes of the Past is the title of all of Mussolini's archaeological enterprises, the most extraordinary took place at Lake Nemi. And what I'd like to say is what were those enterprises? Those enterprises um, were the rising of wonderful marbles from the center of Rome, the very reliefs and portraits of Augustus, the, the, very, the very street scene of Augustus carved in marble, which were buried under the streets of Rome. Um, and in the 1920s, what they did, they, they, they froze an area of central Rome and they, they, rode, they lifted up these marbles and a temple. Um, because Rome itself is based on sands and mud. And the Italians divide the system of freezing the center of Rome underground, right, with pipe work, lifting up the archeology, span um, backfilling um, it with all uh, masonry and all the rest of it, so none of the buildings could survive in the center of Rome. Lo and behold, an engineering marble to recover the marbles themselves. We won't say any more about that because I need to concentrate <coughs> on these ships. Also as well, the removal of the slum district around the Colosseum. The Colosseum was laid bare to be seen. The wonderful triumphal columns, the wonderful um, Roman forums in Rome were revealed for the first time in centuries, thanks to Mussolini's archeologists. Excavations on Sicily to reveal temples, um, ex excavations at Pompeii, excavations at Heraclanium. Billions of pounds of state funding was thrown into the archeology. span And billions of pounds were thrown in to the excavation of these boats at Lake Nemi. Lake Nemi is the, is, is the home, the heart of Romulus and Remus. This is the landscape of true treasures of history. This is the landscape of Coleridge's in Xanadu, the Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. Within that Latin backdrop, do we see the Lake of Nemi? It's a strangely sinister place even today. 
an extinct volcano, a round lake sitting in an inverted cone of wooded hills, a lake the ancient Romans called the Mirror of Diana, the place of the goddess herself, the place of a wonderful temple within the trees that command the watery mirror of itself, the lakeside enlivened with Virgil's lurid trail, tales of ritual, murder, buried treasures, sinister rites, and sacred golden trees. That's the link with Coleridge's, um, um, Coleridge's work there. It's also the landscape of escaped slaves who killed priests. It's also the landscape of maybe um, the likes of Spartacus rested whilst he was heading up and down Italy. Um, about I think it was about 78 BC. This sunken, lost landscape today of water, and just the water, because the boats are no longer with us, still inspire half-forgotten myths. The half-forgotten myth, yea and, yea and behold, of the one vessel still there that the archaeologists have now found. Unfathomable antiquities. The, the lake itself is enlivened with thousands and thousands of, of statues, coins, even bits of temple, even bodies, various bits and pieces, various other vessels as well. The bottomless lake, the bottom of the lake, inspiring those stories that might be true or not true, but to us as archaeologists, they are true. They tell us about those echoes of the pages where you can lift up and blow out the dust and understand the real past. Down through the ages, many people had caught glimpses of two near legendary boats, and not the third one, may I add. That's for us to see over the next decades. These are some of the finest vessels ever to be found in archaeology. The lead line bottoms of these vessels were still there. And there's some problems with the story that the senators tell us. There's some problems with the story of those other writers telling us that after the reign of Caligula, the boats were salvaged, the materials taken away. Why did they leave the lead, lead on these vessels? Why did they leave the beautiful marbles? Why did they leave the copper? Um, they, they, this, the, the, the temples itself built on these barges had copper roof tiles. If you're gonna salvage a vessel as it's still on the lake, you'd surely start with the copper roof tiles and then go downwards. It's likely that the vessels were sunk deliberately or accidental after Caligula's reign um, and everything was left on them. But over the centuries, things have been taken off through salvage. If, um, if Goff, um, if Goff um, as we know, Goff knows a lot about uh, vessels and sailing, Goff would know that a vessel that's 70 meters long, 20 meters wide, um, from um, from starboard to um, the ba port. Uh, uh, port. I was going to say that. I couldn't get the word out. Port starboard. If you say it in the right way, you can always say port starboard. You can never say starboard to port. Anyway, True. port to starboard was 20 meters wide. So a vessel 70 meters from uh, prow to, um, to stern to aft is, is 70 meters. Um, and you've got 20 meters wide, lead lined, um, ranging low in the water, right? very heavy, right? The only way you could keep a vessel like this on, on, a, on a lake like this was to have bilge pumps. And if those bilge pumps aren't used every single day, the ship will soon fill up with water and will sink. So it's likely after the reign of Caligula, these vessels sank under 14 meters of water. So it's, it's quite deep to actually dive that. <coughs> but they eventually managed to find ways to dive there. Um, the, the underwater bell. And apparently the, there's stories in the, in the um, 1500s um, of an early um, diving suit, which consisted of a bucket over somebody's head um, um, connected to a pipe, a pipe. But anyway, that's something else. So over the years, collections of the boat's bronze fittings were being raised, bits of marvel, some of the heaviest bronzes and brasses ever to be found in, in, in an archaeological context. The site itself, um, the vessels themselves, 
um, were probably thousands of tons in weight. Um, laying low in the water would be the naval term. According to small inscriptions and engravings on some water pipes, um, it's said that another great dictator may have built the vessels. But in history, Caligula is the one who's Jay accused for building them, using state funding. Do you see where history wants to lie where it wishes to lie? It's Caligula that was showing off the great engineering skills, the great um, skills of the Roman state. Here's a couple of facts. Um, one fact is, is that they were able to put these vessels on the lake in the first place. To be, able to, launch, to be able to launch these vessels on the lake in the first place, they may have had to have drained part of the lake. Um, and then they, they've, got, they've, got a, they've got a nice um, low-lying base to build the vessel. And then they allow the water to fill in the lake. And then these vessels rise. That's probably an engineering skill that we then do see um, by the, the Italians use to drain the lake. And it said that Mussolini's engineers in, 19, uh, in 1927 found the original drainage system for the lake, simply reoperated it, as you've mentioned, with the sewers of Pompeii still in a good um, state of preservation. Um, and it's then said that the, the vessels just um, rose. Um, and then the vessel itself had several banks of oars. If anyone knows anything about, about a bank of ore, and um, what you have, you have one layer of oarsmen um, with their very long oars. And I'll go on to show you a little bit of evidence. And above that, you may have had another bank of oarsmen above that. Um, and they would have oared in tandem with the ones below them. There's references of 10 banks of oarsmen being on the vessel, which would make it a multi-story galley but these weren't those galleys. There's, there's a reference, however, I don't know how true this is, it's probably unlikely, that there was a galley of Caligula that went from one side of the Bay of Naples to the other side, and it had 10 banks of oars, one layer of oar, oarsmen, another layer of oarsmen, and so on and so on, uh, which is highly unlikely. But the skills used of these oarsmen um, are unbelievable to try and calculate in your mind. Having a, having a load of oarsmen below um, in coordination with another oars, set of oarsmen above so they don't tangle their oars and all the rest of it, that's an engineering skill. And the evidence here is, is that we have, this, this is the, um, this is, um, the um, port and starboard side, but overlapping the port and starboard side, you have these banks of oarsmen. Okay, this, this is what this is for. The, the, these are actually for the oarsmen. Um, so, we need to go on a little bit further. Proportioned like super tankers, the two boats were some 230 feet long, as we said, 70 meters in length. Very broad. And I think the understatement is very heavy. Their decks were decorated with, with marbles and bronze life life-size palm trees. Let's do that again, right? They had bronze life-sized palm trees as well as living, breathing palm trees on this vessel, right? And we don't have that in the history. We have that both in the history and the archaeology. Marble columns. They've been lifting marble columns. columns. Mussolini's archaeologists were lifting marble columns. So these weren't looted at all by the, by the senators to get their money back, right? It was all left there. Um, supporting great pavilions. There, was, there were swimming pools on these barges, right? And they, they constantly changed, grandiose gardens. There's also, there's also discussions that it was a mini, mini coliseum on these things, right? Splendid reconstruction was made in 1911. By the Italians, there's a point to be made here, very important point. 1911, in the International Exhibition at Rome, there was a, they, the Italians showed off their prowess in 1911. They rebuilt one of these things, which cost them millions of pounds in 1911 to rebuild one of these at the International Exhibition in Rome, right? And they, on top of that, they built a floating restaurant. This is 1911. 
if the Italians are doing this before uh, Mussolini and his, and his grandiose ideas, the Italians have always been grand. They've always wanted to show off. So when you look at Mussolini, you can't always say that he was to, be, he was to blame for the economic crisis in the 1940s in Italy. Um, because the Italians have always been despotic. It's always been in their nature. They've always been doing things in a different way, either right or wrong. And that's not a metaphor for something going on today either. So looking at this vessel again, we've had enough of this vessel, but have we? If you look there, if you look there, to actually excavate the vessels, they put in a railway system, right? They actually build a railway system. And yes, this was always on time. And if, um, if you want me to be, if you want me to talk a little bit about vessels, the, the ribs <coughs> are going from port to starboard met five keels. Um, a central keel, keel here, keel there, keel there, keel there. Anyone who knows anything about boat building, if you, if you want um, to build a yacht, you have one keel. If you want to build a barge, you might have three keels. And then they're, they're, you've got a fl if you have if you have a number of keels, you have a flat bottom vessel. If you um, if you have one keel, it's a normal shape of a vessel. This had five keels, and those five keels were meant to take the, the, the timber and the weight. If you if you think about the way um, an arch is created, an arch creates the weight. If you invert that, it that takes the pressure of the water. I think that's a very sound explanation. Let's look at another image, maybe. And again, you, you, can't get, you can't get any more Italian than this scene, right? This is about 1931, just before the vessels are moved. And by the way, the vessels are moved using what they basically do. They, they, they gradually move it onto bogies that lead it into a building, right? Um, and they move the vessel on, on, on several light railways into this building. And engineering, um, engineering skills, and the way to conserve this was thanks to Norwegian and Danish archaeologists. If the word Vasa rings a bell, vessel that went down in 1628, you know how well preserved the Vasa is. And then they go to this vessel, the Norwegians, and they say, we know how to preserve this. Let's give, us a, let's give you a hand, okay? So they worked together on this, Italian, Norwegian, Danish archaeologists, and thank God there were no Germans involved in this one. Um, and there's, there's a reason why I say that, that you'll see at the end. But you can, you can see that there, this is, um, this is Italy. You even have women looking at the excavation of the vessel. Lo and behold, women being able to see this. Um, and, there, and I, there's a child in the queue there. There's, there's a row of women there. Um, loads of gentlemen in their hats. And it gives you an idea of the scale of this vessel. This is really showing what it is. This is really showing the elegance of archaeology. The elegance of the excavation. The love of archaeology. And what the Italians felt about their past. You know, we, we always hear about... Um, we always hear in the Second World War that... Um, about the, the, the poor nature of the Italian na Navy and the Army and the Air Force, which are all complete lies. The Italians had many good planes in the Second World War, but they didn't have enough. They had many good soldiers, but they didn't have enough. They had many good tanks, but they didn't have enough. Um, so to repaint the picture, it was the Italians that saved the Germans retreating at Al Alamein with three tanks. The Italians took out 150 British tanks using three of their own tanks in, in North Africa. You're not told that of the Italians. So when you repaint this, what the Italians were trying to achieve, they wanted a backdrop of greatness. And these boats were, start, were wanting to put the Italians into their greatness box. However much you want to feel that that's right or wrong, what, the, what this <coughs> is in archaeology is best. It's not the biased archaeology that we're doing in Britain. Okay? In Britain, for example, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, around the same time, he's excavating at um, the likes of, a few years earlier, he was excavating at Cleon. He's, he's excavating at um, Maiden Castle. And the work, that our, uh, the work that Sir Mortimer Wheeler is writing about is having to be repainted, right? Because he told us a few things that weren't right. You know, there was never a siege of Maiden Castle, but we believed it ever since. When we look at the Germans, for example, we see them rewriting history. When we look at the great temples in Greece, 
the Italians are simply finding their archaeology and saying, this is what we've got. Look at what we've got. And they don't have to make it up. Everyone else is jealous of this. They're very jealous. To drain the lake, Mussolini employs a great engineer, Rishi, Corrado Rishi. Corrado Rishi is employed by Mussolini to drain the lake. He's working with the very great archaeologist Giuseppe Moretti. And if you want to know a little bit about Giuseppe Moretti and the obsession that archaeologists have and the obsessional characters that we have, um, Giuseppe Moretti, in finding that the, um, that the guards had left him at Pompeii and that the Italian army had left him at Pompeii, as the American army is approaching Pompeii, he's standing on the walls with a rifle, shouting and screaming at the Americans to stay away, right? He, he, he shoots at the, at the American tanks as they're approaching Pompeii. He wants to protect it because the Americans have only bombed it a few days before. Um, and as he turns, he has a bullet up his backside and he runs away, right? This is the spirit of Italian archaeologists in regards to their archaeology. They don't want it to fall in anyone else's hands. Corrado Rishi constructed um, four large electric water pumps to drain the lake. And it said within a few years, within three years, they drain off um, 1.4 um, billion cubic feet of, of water from the lake which is quite an achievement. Um, and they also use the ancient <coughs> Roman water system to drain the lake. This is, this is Lake Diana. This is revealing her boats. This is like taking off a woman's clothing and showing what she's got below, beneath it all. These are, the, these are the true vessels. These are the true spirits of the woman that is Lake Diana. By 1931, the vessels are to be seen by those queuing to see them. By 1932, international kings of, of uh, the likes of Denmark and Spain and princes of our own land and presidents and prime ministers are visiting this vessel and Mussolini showing in 10 years, look what I've done. I've turned around the country and look at your countries. Your countries um, are in great uh, depressions whilst we are revealing our past. <clears throat> um, and I know one of you wants to say, look, they invaded, um, they, they, evade, they invaded Ethiopia and look what happened there. But um, that's another thing altogether. Nothing like this had ever been seen. And nothing like this will ever be seen again until they raise the other vessel. Um, Gillian said that she visited this um, location um, and there wasn't much to see. Um, that's because the vessels had been burnt to, to a cinder. And whoever is, whoever is iPad, um, whatever, right? Um, we've got a good view of their kitchen. Um, in 1933, a most elegant single double hanger was set beside the lake to house these two fantastic tokens of the might and ingenuity of ancient Italy. And the hangers themselves were an engineering master, mastery. To have a hanger spanning this made out of concrete, um, and they still stand today, um, tells us a lot about the Italians and, and what, what they wanted. They wanted for everyone to marvel. To marvel and marvel. This is a, this is a, a marvel of, of his, his Highness Caligula. He's looking at you with those deep piercing eyes. Do you see a despot? Do you see a misunderstood child of 28 who's assassinated by his own guard? Or do you just see somebody trying to lead a world um, with, a, with a great deal of problems? <laughs> got, got a visitor. <laughs> who's the visitor? <laughs> well, you did say something. <laughs> Bye, golf. <laughs> I'd uh, like a visitor. Would you oh, like a visitor? Like yes. 
do, do, do you know what? I was th- well, we'll just I'll take a little interjection a second. You know, we, we haven't let anyone say anything for 50 minutes, which is really unusual for me. I haven't got Dennis <laughs> constantly interrupting. Or that silly cow, Ellen. Or that Kathy and recorrecting my English, you know? Um, I miss them all. And little Alan, me, bo- me picking on Alan in the corner next to me. But um, I haven't had any visitors for days, and it's just like I'm going out to post letters um, later on today, um, just just to see if there's anyone still out there. Um, <laughs> so anyway, these these shelters, the, these these aircraft hangars, flying the flag of Italy, create these. Right, hang on a minute. Ooh. I've You've got somebody be. phoning me and it's Keith, right? I think I better get it because he's part of the car. Keith, what would you like to say? I say hello to everybody. Just remind you that I'm here. Uh, yes, we are reminded that you're here, right? The one thing about this, Keith, right? Why are you phoning like so somebody who's interrupting like Dennis, you know? I, I miss your interruptions, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I, look, I, I've had familiarity. I don't need any more, okay? Anyway, Keith says hello if you can hear him. Go on, everybody say hello. Hello, hello Keith. Keith. <laughs> you, you hey, can, boss. Oh, and Goff sat down <laughs> hello, as well. Okay, back to the class. Uh, I'll speak to you soon, darling. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. I tell you what, you, you, you've all set the mark today. I think this is really working well. So back to these enormous hangers. They, they, they were held in these wonderful slings. They, they, they were held there within these hangars. And, and people visited these, these vessels. They visited them for, for just over a decade. But I think, the biggest, I think the biggest mistake that the Italians ever did was actually to enter the war. Um, if, the Italians, if the Italians had not entered the war, um, the, um, the Germans would have probably have won anyway. Uh, the Italians made no difference to the war effort, um, and everything that we're seeing today would still be there if the Italians hadn't entered the war, right? But that's life. So for a few years, millions and millions of people would visit these vessels alongside the dark lake, the mysterious lake of Virgil. Then when war came to Italy, the boats inside their hangars gave shelter to hundreds of refugees. And that's where we're going to stop with that bit, because what I want to do is I want to get back into these images, a bit more discussion going, but we're just coming up to the break. Now, you know that thing I mentioned ages ago? Can you remember an hour ago I mentioned um, about the lead? Now, I was just about yeah. to say in 1944 that, um, that the vessels were set alight, right? <clears throat> and all they found a few days later were a load of timbers. I've sat down and tried to work out whether lead can evaporate. The answer is it can't. Um, lead is one of those wonderful things that, is <coughs> that can turn quickly into a liquid. It can go gaseous, but that goes back into a solid. And if you're gonna burn this vessel, right, the lead is, gonna, the lead is just gonna be in the way, right? You've got to remove the lead for the wood to be set alight. Because as the lead is melting, as I've already said, the timbers would be wrapped around in the molten lead and the oxygen would be extinguished from the, from the timbers burning and there would be lead, there would be timber and a lot of it would have survived. No lead was found. So you could probably work out what really happened. The Americans or the Germans deliberately set light to the, this vessel to obtain the lead. However, looking at that there, Looking at that very vessel, I think this is a second of the vessels because it doesn't actually show any of the um, the sort of um, the 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 banking for the oarsmen. It doesn't actually show that on this one. So I think this is a second one. I think that all came off. Um, but this itself, you can actually see the lead underneath. This is a one sheet of lead underneath. So obviously individual bits of state are lead riveted. There's two sheets of lead. There's three sheets of lead underneath the vessel. And again, this would, have, this would have lain low in the water. Um, and anyone that knows anything about vessels, if a vessel lays low in water, a little, a, a, a little movement in the Beaufort scale would mean that the vessel would destabilize, it would soon f- fill, be filled with water, and it would capsize. So it's quite likely the vessel was kept, kept near the shore, 
and that's where they were found. They would have been anchored, and occasionally the oarsmen would be there so that Caligula, whoever was there, would get an idea um, of, of their strength, you know, to get into the, the theme of things. But this was a play garden. It was, all, it was all a play garden. But they did float, and they were there for a few years. And this, uh, this is after they've moved into the uh, building. You can actually see a rail there still in place as it's being moved in. One, that's one of the rails underneath. Uh, you can actually see they, they've more or less just moved it in there. And look at that hangar there. To have us, I, I know some of you are saying, what's the big deal? But this is not only, the, 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 um, the port and starboard side is, is 20 meters wide. So then, then to get room either side, you'd probably need about 40 meters. So the, 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 the cement span here is over 40 meters wide, right? Which, which is a great span for any building. And it's still there today. And I'm, I'm going to ask Gillian, were you impressed when you saw the, the, these buildings and then disappointed when he went indoors? Is that a good translation of what you felt, Gillian? To be honest, Carl, we didn't see them. Oh. Because when we went, we were just driving through and I didn't really know that much about all of this. So you were in the taverna. Pardon? You were in the taverna. Probably. And a glass of wine. <laughs> yes, that's what I said. <laughs> All I remember of that holiday, lots of things, but the lake itself, it was very beautiful with all the trees and the countryside. But I didn't know then about the boats. No, no. And, and Carl, I tell you, yeah, I, go on, go off. I'm going to say to you what you were saying about the, because the vessel is so wide and it's very low down, all the weight. 2,000, 3,000 tons, whatever it was. Yeah. It would be imp impossible to overturn that because the center of gravity is so low. So, so it's so, not a commercial vessel, is it? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's uh, no. So you couldn't really, um, it's amazing, yeah. So, so you're, you're saying because of the absolute uh, bodaciousness of this, because of the grandiose nature, because the amount of resources plied into it, it it's unlikely it would have sunk. Um, it, it no, it wouldn't turn no. over. No, so no, no. too much weight on the bottom. The ge geometric height, the center of gravity is right down. So, so it's very, very low. So it would be almost impossible to capsize it. But what about when the center of gravity rises? That's when it. Uh, so that's when the it only, that's the a only, technical thing. No, that's good. I needed that. I needed that. So the only way for this to actually um, sink would be that the overburden would. Um, yeah there would be more of an overburden. So you'd have the overburden and then it would fill with water and then it would sink. But yeah. if there was no buildings on top, now this is a good point. This is a really good point to explore. If, if everything had been removed above, it's likely that these vessels would never have sunk. Is that correct? Correct. So in other words, that's, that's the proof we needed. So in other words, they sank because the bilges weren't kept going. They sank. That goes yeah. in with the evidence that we're seeing. And when the senators say that they, 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 they salvaged this, these vessels, I don't believe that they did. We had somebody else no, saying was, this on Tuesday. There was no buoyancy. Buoyancy keeps it afloat. You take away the buoyancy, yeah. fill it up with water, whatever, it'll sink. Bingo. So that's, that's basically what we needed. And, and, and for, for, for the sake of this, that, this is why, to be honest with you, the reason why this went on so long on Tuesday was because... Um, we had two, uh, no, we had three people who had done naval stuff in a class of four, so you can imagine. Um, and, I got, and I got something wrong in the lecture as well. And it was so good that I'd actually got it wrong because it added to the lecture, but we won't, we'll, we'll tell you the mistake I made in a short while. Um, we're gonna do a couple more slides um, and then, then we'll have a break. So th these are actually, um, you can imagine, these wonderful brass lions, th these are actually shown uh, with those rings, you can imagine wow. the, these being established all the way around the vessel, right? Um, and when you look at the archaeology, the artifacts from this vessel, I want you to do some research yourself, guys. You've all got inter internet access. Type in Nimi Boats artifacts, right? You'll see loads of stuff. But if I went into that, this would be a three-hour lecture. But, but these are wow, right? Um, lost wax method 
Um, the, if, if these were on the open market today, they, they would go for a fortune individually. These are columns. Um, they're, they're not going to be associated with your, the, um, they're not going to be associated with yours because you wouldn't have had much movement with yours. But you can imagine that these would have been arranged around the structures there. And the reason why I'm faffing with trying to find words is there was, it was used for many different structures. Stone structures. You've got, you've got these bronze trees, for God's sake. Huge palm trees. The amount of weight in flower pots. How does all this work? The, the decks. Oh, and what did they use to build? Um, what was the timber? Now, they've done a reconstruction today in oak, right? We all know that the British Navy, oak and all the rest of it, that's great. But a, a, a timber that's far better for building vessels with is actually cedar wood. So, so the tim, and it, it, it was, it gives you buoyancy. Um, cedar wood can, um, can out, outlive rot and so can oak as well, but, but cedar is what they used. But to reconstruct this today out of cedar wood would, is an impossibility. And look at that there. Go on, ask me what these are. I have no, I don't have the foggiest, but you can imagine if you've got dozens of panel, hundred, dozens of panels on, on walls showing hands and bits of bodies and stuff. The one thing I need to put in here as well, you know, you know, I mentioned about um, uh, that there's word that they salvaged this vessel uh, back in the day in the Roman period. We, that's that's dis dismissed now. Um, but um, it's, it's very likely that in the 1700s, about 1750 odd, the kings and queens of Naples, I know it's a little bit south, probably a little bit out of their jurisdiction, may have actually sent people to salvage um, some metals from the vessels because the, the kings and queens of Naples were also the same people who looted Heraclanium and Pompeii for their precious metals. And this, when I say precious metals, your coppers, your bronze, your lead, bit of gold, bit of silver, whatever, and so on and so on. So um, the, it's likely that they would have been salvaging a great deal of material. But what we've got left is quite extraordinary. You're seeing some of the extraordinary nature. Um, and when, when we think about it, the, the Romans were very good in their bronzes because um, if you look at that as well, just, just sort of an undercurrent of where we go. Can you see that that there, you can see the finger, the, the thumb is rising there. You can see the shadow on it um, and, and the gentle nature of the hand. I, I don't, I, I, I'm struggling to work out whether this is life size or bigger, but the skill used in creating that meets no bounds. Um, in, in, a, in a way, the, the, the Ro I, I think I've said this before, the Romans were great with their, with their, um, with their metal work. They were great with their statuary. Um, in most cases, they weren't great with their paintings. But we do have a, some really good paintings being found at Pompeii now. But their metalwork was exquisite. Some of the best ever made. And later on, it's the Italians who make some of the best bronzes as well. And some of the best. Um, if you look at Ma Michelangelo, if you, if you look at some of those other um, craftsmen and so on, you, you see where we go. Um, now, again, Right. We'll, we'll, we'll have a break now. <clears throat> if, if Caligula is this despot, why is he being immortalized by the Italians? Because this, this is, a, this is a, the, on his fa favorite horse. And actually, to be honest with you, somebody mentioned the name of this fa famous horse on Tuesday. I can't remember the name of it. That's a bit of homework. He had a f oh, yeah, this is it, right? Yeah, I remember it now. It's coming back to me. He actually had a horse that, um, that he actually said to the Senate, I want this horse to actually be a senator. Um, and they all, they, they all voted for the horse to be a senator. Before the horse could actually stand in the Senate, right, he was actually assassinated. It, it was actually his favorite horse. But was that actually true or was it false? That's the point. Because later on, He's so derided, but then again, the Italians immortalize him. They know something that we don't. Um, it's, it's the equivalent of us um, immortalizing King John, who was a complete tosspot, right? We don't immortalize King John. We don't have many statues to him in Britain. But in Italy, no matter what they've said about this man, he's admired in the later statue he carved um, in the 14, 15, 16, 1700s onwards. And when we get to Lake Nimi, 
he's brought into the, the Mussolini's pantheon of the Italian state. So what I'm going to do there, um, I'm going to show you ne our next image, but we're not going to discuss this yet. But it gives you food for thought. What we're going to do, um, I'm going to, we're going to have a break, not for 15 minutes because, um, um, you know, Keith not, doesn't have to go to the kitchen to put the kettle on. Kathy doesn't have to go into the kitchen and give everyone a lecture about the fact that none of the men do any of the washing up. Um, nobody has to cut K uh, Chris's cake. And Gillian doesn't have to moan and groan that, um, um, that I am paid her for the, um, for the milk. Are there any questions? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. So, um, so. Cup of tea. Right, go on, go on. Kathy, go into the kitchen and make, make yourself useful making a cup of tea. Oh, and by the way, Chris, right? You... Every t hang on, I'm doing a talking out. By the way, Chris, right? You, all, you just put the tea bag in there, right? You always leave the tea bag in there and you never put the milk in. You know, <laughs> why'd you do that? Keith does that for me and I love him to bits. Let's have some questions. Let's have just one question and we'll have a break. Uh... Go on, Gillian. Gillian. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Oh, go on, Gillian. You know you want to. I know I want to. I'm absolutely gutted, Gillian. Yeah, you're right. I'm absolutely gutted. I'm not acting. And I don't have to dress. I can't dress up as a woman to have an excuse now. I'm just really gutted. Right? And I can't wander around the, the house in Michelle's dresses because they're stepchildren of year. So I don't have an excuse to do any of my acting. I'm, I'm really, I'm sorry. Anyway, Keith's got a question to ask. Right, Keith, uh, you're on speaker. Give us, give us what you want to say. Go for it. Everyone can hear you. Right, it's not a question, it's a bit of news. Go for it. I noticed in my paper today they were saying they've made some Roman discoveries at Lanwern. Oh, Lan oh. Lanwern. So obviously. Um, a complex rectangular building with multiple rooms, okay, one containing a rare example of a mosaic core. Lanwern in Gwent, yeah? Ah, uh, I know about that one, but they're still working on it, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now what, I, what I'm going to say is everybody, um, if you do want to scan these in and email them to me, that will be, I will be very, very grateful. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, when you do receive the, um, when you do receive the newsletter this month, in the next few days, you'll see, uh, you'll see four images of, of um, Dennis in the newsletter. So if you can send me these articles um, it, to me, we can use some of these in the newsletter. Right, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna take a break and uh, we'll be back in about uh, under 10 minutes. Okay. Any old iron, any old iron, any, any old iron. You look sweet, you look sweet. Uh, so is Gillian with her funny feet. La 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 la. Oh, we love Gillian. La la la. Right, so we've got, so still up there now, we've got um, Gillian's using her iPad and it's facing into the garden. Um, Joff is there. Um, we've got Keith, so that's good. Jim is there. Jim, I tell you what, you do the entertainment because I'm going to get a cup of tea. I've just put the kettle on. I've had my orders. Put the kettle on. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, oh, I, I, I tell you that woman of yours is that woman of yours is a proper dragon. Oh, I know it's awful. <laughs> I'm under the thumb. Can I just can I just say why why have you managed to end up with the only attractive woman that ever worked in the National Museum of Wales? <laughs> There's no answer to that, is there? <laughs> good look, well, good looks and charm. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I think it was because <laughs> do, you know, do you know what it was? You, you, a few years ago when I met Michelle, right? She said um, um, I didn't know a chat up line was. Um, would you Would you like me to take some photographs of you, right? Um, for, for, for your for your acting uh, portfolio, and I said yes. And then I then I jokingly said, um, I then jokingly said, why didn't you take photographs of me nude, right? And then it went on from did you there. Keep your socks on. Is, no, yeah, I did actually. Did that happen with you, Keith? Uh, not Keith, Jim. Yeah. 
<laughs> did, did it happen with you so, as well? So we'll, we never get to, we get it. So what do you do with Michelle while, while you're online? Do you hide her away in the cupboard? <laughs> Uh, no, oh, she's, she's working. No, she's still working in her own mint. Yeah, and I got the I got my two stepchildren upstairs still in bed. So, so um, what I, I now I'm gonna have a, I've got to um get something to eat. So I'm gonna do that. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some quick jam um quick um lemon curd on toast. So I'm gonna do that now. See you in a minute. Okay. Ta -ta. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still there, Karen? No. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, there's somebody's kitchen there. Oh, hi, Goff. <laughs> Are you going to the loo? <laughs> Cup of tea. <laughs> nice set of books. Pardon? Nice set of books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Behind. Oh, it's Elena. <laughs> Get making me a cup of tea. <laughs> oh, woman. Get those cups full of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asleep. <laughs> Jim, what just what I've got? I, we've got crumpets. Oh, oh. great! Pass one, pass one through the screen. <laughs> I've got a chocolate biscuit. Oh wow! Oh, that's oh. nice. Is it chocolate? It is. Oh yeah! Wow, that looks nice. Essential. <laughs> I feel really jealous now. <laughs> You've got plenty of your own chocolate biscuits, Jim. So how are you, Gillian? You looking after yourself? Yeah, we're okay, Jim. Good. Are you yeah, staying we're... in, or? Are you... Yes, we are yeah, really. We're... I mean, Derek goes down to get the shopping once a week, um, just down to Philco or Co-op. But no, basically, we're staying in, just going out for a one walk. Yes, yeah. Uh, nothing else to do, really. <laughs> All this. Oh, it's Carl's chicken. <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 Ellie, look, look, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is my cock. <laughs> <laughs> He's big, isn't he? <laughs> <I'm> jealous. <laughs> you got a bigger cock than I have. <laughs> <laughs> Gillian. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you didn't get the innuendo there. I did. <laughs> was that very was that very naughty of me and Jim? <laughs> You're both very naughty boys. Well, that's what Michelle says to me every night. Yep, you are very naughty boys. He's not the Messiah. He's a very naughty. <laughs> the Messiah is a very naughty boy. <laughs> 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 oh, there you go. Look, it was lovely. I gotta get up with my crumpet. Hey, here's another one for you, Jim. I'm gonna have a beer crumpet. Don't give him a kiss. There you go. Oh, there you go. I thought that was for me. I'm right, gonna go and get this now. I'm gonna. Uh... Have you seen anybody out and about? Um, I. I, uh, I saw Andrea once, and I think I've seen Chris once out. Christine, oh, you know, Chris, what? Christine. I've spoken uh, to Liz. Oh, yeah. I messaged Keith, and he said yeah. he was okay. But I haven't seen anybody else. No, uh, I was wondering how Ellen was getting on with her broken arm, wasn't it, she had? Who? Apparently. Ellen had a broken arm. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, Carl mentioned it last week. So, so I expect she's still indoors, I should think. How did she do that? I don't know. I'm not sure. I have to ask Carl. He's got, he's got all the story. Oh, 
Oh, I've seen, I've seen Adam. Who's Adam? Blonde, tall, young. I yeah. don't know. Hi, Adam. Tall Adam. Do uh, oh, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Oh, he's got a, he's got a job in uh, field coat. Do, do, do you want to have a look at our crew? Yeah, come on. Yeah. There she is. Working in field coat. Can you see my crow? Mm-hmm. That's Sherpy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's that my Sherpa. By the way, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and boost your power, uh, Jim. I, I'm just getting my crumpets now. Oh. Yeah. Paul. Hello. Paul. Yes, darling. How did Ellen break her arm? Um. I. I Whenever I speak to her, right, I'm, uh, I, oh, Karen. I'm not exactly sure. I think she fell over in the house or something. Oh, gosh. So, uh, yeah, I don't... But she gives her love profusely. It's, it's, it's strange having a conversation with Ellen. It's like, give my love to everybody. And she says, I love you. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I supposed to say? And I got Michelle in the room and I'm thinking, yeah, I love you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you never say that to me. That's because you've no <laughs> idea, Julian. Oh, me. <laughs> oh, dear. Poor Ellen. Well, it must be terrible with a broken arm. Oh, gosh, yes. And, and yes. to be stuck inside like that. Oh, gosh, imagine it. Oh, it's horrible, awful. It's bad yeah. enough. Yeah. I haven't been out of it all. Mm. Yeah. Just got my delivery of stuff. Good. Okay. I just got a delivery from my well, ex-wife. Well, she went shopping for me. Ah, right. Derek nice does. Very, very nice of her. Yeah. Yeah. I've just ordered three more books. So she's furloughed from work. My, my uh, daughter's a. Uh, Oh. <laughs> but my son works in Wix. They're still working, click and collect, and he's just had a two hundred pound bonus. Oh! <laughs> if you need your DIY stuff, that's where you go. Yeah. Click and collect. Yeah. Paint and stuff like that. Nails. Yeah. Hey, do you know what, Gillian? We've managed what? to get hold of crumpets. Oh, I don't like mm. them. Gillian, there's nothing wrong with a bit of crumpet. Oh, there is. <laughs> oh, I love a bit of crumpet. <laughs> I'd rather have a hot cross bun. I just had a hot cross bun. <laughs> oh, no. hot cross bun. Yeah. <laughs> Do you toast yours? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> The oh, Easter time. Oh, the toaster. <laughs> oh, you must have big ones, Jim. Oh. <laughs> Don't tell everybody. <laughs> They'll all want one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like hot buns. <laughs> you have to laugh. Well, yeah, I'd be crying otherwise. You would be crying otherwise. <laughs> I went to the Bridgen class last week in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Anybody oh. there? <laughs> yeah. Go up. And? The lady there's a bit of a nutter. I <laughs> 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 don't know any names, but... Hang on, we've got to have a drum roll for me. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Oh, so um, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. So I got. I got to ask, right? Does anyone is anyone watching a series of Picard? The what? Um, the the new Star, Star Trek. Trek series, yeah. No. Oh, no, it's on Amazon Prime. Are you watching? Can't afford it. 
Bloody hell, this is what you say when you come along to my classes each week. <laughs> Goff was just going to tell us about your Bridge End class. Goff, please tell us about my Bridge End class because I've given up. Go on. That, that the certain lady that I was talking about, uh, who you know. Who's called Anne? I don't know why she's in an archaeology class. Why? Her contributions have nothing to do with archaeology. That's correct. <laughs> Bit like me then. Not at all like you, no. Not, <laughs> Not at all, at all like, like you. you. <laughs> exact opposite to you. <laughs> <laughs> she seems a very pleasant lady. But... Oh, oh well, there we go. But as you've been to the Lanswick Major class, because Kathy and Dennis won't tell anyone their experience, what, what, uh, no, the Bridgen class, what do you think? Well, there's a couple of the two guys there seem, seem fine, but that lady, I'm not sure about her, to be honest with you. <laughs> Is she the only lady? No. She was the only one there last week, wasn't she? Yeah, there was another woman called Pat, but you didn't see her. No. What, she's invisible? No, she was there. <laughs> invisible Pat. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Bad Lady Barbara, Invisible Pat, <laughs> and... Um, Anne? We've got a name for Anne? No, we just call her Looney Anne. <laughs> Looney Anne. <laughs> Her heart's in the right place. We, we love her. She, she gave me loads of help over the years with different things. Her heart's in the right place. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, but, you know. Yeah, I'm glad I don't go there all the time. Again, There's to their there. class. What's that, lovely? Does she want Goff to go to their class now? Is she trying to poach him from ours? Yeah, she's after me. <laughs> she likes sailors. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All the nice girls do. That's yeah. true. It's the uniform. Yeah. Yes, it every time. It's a brass button. <laughs> and also, it's something to do with the Golden Rivet, isn't it? Oh, shut up, you. <laughs> <laughs> the Goff, is that actually true, though? Yes. No, it can't be. Really? It is. I've used that. That tactic many times. We won't ask for what. Right, I've got a bulb called what? You what? You've got a what? I've got, <laughs> I've got a what bulb? Right, okay. Oh. Karen's gone very quiet. No, oh, still oh, here. Just Car enjoying my drink. Karen's a rebel. I'm lacing my coffee with Bailey's. <laughs> oh, Carol. So I'm having a very nice cup of coffee Carol. here. <laughs> Carl? What she said, Carol? What? Yeah, go on. Carl? Yep. Yeah. If I say... want to attend the uh, ghost lecture on Saturday. Yeah. Anyway, let's get started now. Yeah, how carry do on. I, how do I pay you? Right, okay. Um, yeah, can I can I can I just can I just explain a couple of things? We've um, we've 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 decided that um, we we've we've decided that we're going to do a lot more things online. And when we actually come back, the the way the way people are paying for things is going to continue um, because it seems that everything seems to have worked out a lot better actually than than we ever thought. Um, so back to the money thing with the with the with the ghost evening. If you wanted to. If you wanted to come in on that for 7.30, and it really worked well last week, we put the recording online. Um, yeah. You, you saw that, did you? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want, it, you, it's a bit a simple matter of, um, I think if you haven't got access to PayPal, I think it's a matter of um, putting six pounds over via your bank account or something. If you want to do that. Yeah, I've got your details. I'll just put it in your account. Yeah, that's fine. As a one-off. Well, if you just want to do a one-off, because next week we are doing, um, remind me what we're doing this Saturday. And you'll send me the link then. Yeah, I'll send, you, I'll send you the link. Well, for, the, for, those, okay. for those that don't know anything about what we're talking about, we're, get, we're going to um, show you uh, what, we've, <clears throat> what we've decided, because um, 
because we're not because we can't do our ghost walks now and and um the two that we've done this year we've had about 30 people on them and the last one we did uh was was the weekend was i think the weekend before the the close down and um and we thought it'd be a shame not to continue things going but obviously because we haven't got walks um so if i show you what we've got on the website then everybody can be in on this one so here we go uh, this is our this is our this is our ghost walk website um and if i move everybody over there so basically for those that those that um however is our attention in having a series of live ghost storytelling evenings um how do we monitor this with honesty and integrity is up to you our loyal customer base so basically anyone who wants to take part we're talking about the money side of things there uh, the storytelling with carl uh, amy and owen will last for at least one hour with questions to follow and discussion what you need is zoom that you're using now we put a thing up online and you can book um you can book per person for five pounds it's five pound goff and this week starts at 7 30 last week we did ogmore castle and this week we're doing uh my steg the dark side of history all right and then the following week will be so anyone who wants to join that let me know after this um and we'll send you a link it's it's five pounds and um you can get that to me and you can do that via backs and if you are interested let let me know um let me know at the end anyway thanks for thanks for mentioning it's because we've got so much going on i just can't mention everything every week but um uh that's that so what i'd like to do now i'm gonna i'm gonna um i got some notes that I want us to look at now. Some just background stuff. And then, then what we will then do uh, is simply go back to these images. Um, okay. I got to exit the full screen a minute. And I've got to try and put this down there. Well, okay. I've got a, a, a computer thing I've got to deal with a minute okay good right so we've got some information about who Caligula was uh, we know his family so that's a good background we know why it was called little boot um, and can everybody still hear me yeah, yes. well, yeah. yeah. right because I'm, I'm just reading from the screen and I'm not sure that you're actually um, seeing me or not um, so we can yeah. say is is that um, the few sources that describe Caligula um, I've mentioned show him as a cruel, sadistic, extravagant, sexual deviant, and presenting him as an insane tyrant. However, those same sources tell us that the first six months of his room was moderate and noble. So maybe he did something that upset people. Um, he didn't just build one um, aqueduct leading into Rome. He built two, the um, Aqua Claudia and the um, Anio Novus. Now, Rome itself has a number of aqueducts leading into it, and he was responsible for instigating two of them. So, with all that said, and we know a bit about his background, we don't need to do any, anything like this. So within the first year of his reign, um, he was into political and public, public reform. He published the accounts of the public funds. Um, so in other words, he said to the people, this is how your money's being you know, spent. And before that, um, Tiberius had banned the way the money was being spent. So no matter how... The money was being spent. He was telling people, we're going to spend this money on a temple. We're going to spend this money on an aqueduct. And as long as people knew. That doesn't sound like a despot, actually. This is also something interesting. Those that homes had been set alight by accidental causes or deliberate, he would, he would aid financially those householders. Does that sound like a nutcase? He also, um, he also abolished certain taxes. So whereas I, I today, myself personally, are one for abolishing inland revenue taxes, um, you know, he was into that. He, he, he was a, into abolishing taxes, which was great. 
Um, and also the gymnastic events which were taking place, nobody ever used to have any prizes for them. He was then saying, look, let's start giving prizes. Um, he also uh, restored, wait for it, the practice of democratic elections. Does that sound like a despot to you? So this is, this is some of the things that we know about. However, we do know that later on in his reign, um, there was a little bit of a financial crisis due to the fact that he was assisting people with payments due to their homes being set alight with, with his extravagant building schemes. Um, and then he decided to levy taxes on, on, on he, he was the first Roman emperor to levy a tax on prostitution. There's a joke there, but I'm not going to say it in front of uh, Gillian. Um, there's, there's also, um, there's also um, various other things that we can go on to. So there's different, um, he also um, puts forward the idea of commissioners that could be investigated and that they could be, um, that they could be sort of put on trial, you know? So, so there's those different things. Um, so what really happened was that um, it's likely that everything then with the history centers around these vessels, which is rather interesting. Um, and is the aftermath, the assassination and aftermath of, of, of Cla um, Caligula before we go on to the images, uh, Caligula's actions as emperor were described as being um, especially harsh to the Senate. Um, and the reason why it's described as that, um, because, because of this idea um, that he wanted um, his, his favorite horse, as we've already said, to be put up as a senator. Um, so in other words, he was deriding the Senate. But then again, there's so much you can say about Caligula. And one thing I wanted to mention again was this um, expedition of AD 40. Before we go on to the ship, this expedition of AD 40 that some say Caligula um, did invade Britain, and most people say that he didn't. Um, it's said, however, that Caligula managed to get to the shores of Britain. He meets Adminius, who's a local leader. Adminius says, Caligula, um, I bequeath you um, Britain. Uh, you know, Britain's now under your control. And Caligula says, thank you very much. He gets back on his boat, heads back to um, the port at Boulogne, probably Calais. And he says to his men, well, I didn't actually return with anything, but now I'm the leader of Britain. Can you all collect mussel shells off the beach, into your helmet, put them into, into carts, and that was then sent to Rome. That's, that's my interpretation. The other interpretation is, as I said earlier on, that um, because the le Roman legionaries with him wouldn't go, and only him and a few of his bodyguard went, because if his Roman legionaries didn't go with him, it said that on his return, he said to the Roman legionaries, um, you spineless lady bastules, in revenge for your lack of support for my invasion of Britain, you are all to collect mussel shells into your helmets, um, and then you are to empty your helmets, and I'm gonna say to the, um, the Senate that we conquered Britain. It was to sort of, um, it was sort of to make a mockery of his man. And that's um, one of these stories that we're told. Um, the evidence tells us that um, two years later, uh, well, three years later, because he was assassinated in the AD 41, two years after that, um, the new Roman emperor, Claudius, uh, invaded the spearhead of the invasion into Britain, which led to Britain becoming a Roman province. It was, it was very easy. It was very easy um, for um, Claudius to invade Britain. 
And the reason why I feel it was very easy is because a few years earlier, um, Caligula had already set the seeds. Um, and it was almost, it was so easy for, Claude, uh, for Claudius to invade uh, Britain. He managed to, get fairly, managed to get fairly inland before he came up with any resistance. Um, unlike the earlier invasions of Julius Caesar. So I smell a rat, but that rat is going to disappear down a drain pipe because where we're going to go now is those <coughs> images again. And Gillian, I was just looking at you, full blown in the, in the camera then, right? Absolutely gorgeous as ever. And as for you, Karen, I love those glasses. Karen and Gillian, I've got the same glasses. Have you noticed, boys? <laughs> right, so we're gonna, we we're gonna share. I wasn't looking at the glasses. <laughs> oh. uh, not the same. <laughs> I gotta be honest we with you. Can't... <laughs> we can't see Ooh. each other. <laughs> I can see all of you guys. Yeah, but we can't see each other. I can. Can you can you see all of us? Because you're Not using. Now, but I just, oh yeah. Yeah, because you're using an iPad, Gillian. Um, it, it's um, because because. No, I'm you're, on an iPad. You're on an iPad. <laughs> oh, you got a different type of iPad. Then I was going to be my excuse. Yeah. Last week, last week, excuse me, I was still on excuse the iPad. Excuse me. I can see all of you. Well, I gotta be honest with you, right? Size isn't everything, uh, Gillian. There's a little button to press for that for this view for that view. Michelle said it. <laughs> Somewhere I can't remember where. Uh, right in oh. the left. In the top top left hand corner. On mine is the bottom right left hand corner. No. I tell you what. I tell you what. So when, all you can see now is the screen. When on on when we're back doing these classes on a Thursday, right? I'll show you how to use it properly. <laughs> a bit late then. Yeah, so I was hoping you'd say that. Right, so looking, looking at this, what we've got is a, um, is a galley, a barge, a ship, a vessel, however you'd like to describe it. Um, and if you're, if you're talking about, the word is, I've got to, I've got to uh, uh, right, if you're talking about several banks of oars, because that's one bank of ore, if you put a bank above it, that's two banks of oarsmen. If you put a bank above that, that's three banks of oarsmen, which makes the vessel called a trireme. Tree trireme. A trireme had three banks of oarsmen. And the way that worked was as the oars are being pushed um, back <coughs> and then they're brought level, then the other bank of oars is being pushed back, they're brought level, and the other bank of oars is being pushed back their bought level, and it goes on and on and on. The amount of organization to decide the, the order of the rowing is very complicated. And you would have needed about two or three men to oar. Basically, you're oaring a, a, a whole tree there. That's basically what an oar is. A whole oar with a flat edge on one side. And you know, the other words I learned the other day um, uh, was the word um, feathering. Um, do you know what that is? Um, 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 Goff will know what the word feathering means. Yeah, feathering is when you it, you go straight in the water. The blade That's right. is not pushy. Yeah. That's right. Um, so anyway, back back to this drawing. We've got many descriptions of what these vessels look like, and the archaeology tells us many ways of how the buildings on top of the barge should look like. And, look like. Um, and luckily enough. Um, the archaeologists did take very good records of the vessel, you know, before they were burned. So we we're able to make a reconstruction. Unlike the Leicester University archaeologists, they even get the height with the body at St. B's. But that's the other lecture. So this reconstruction is probably <coughs> too small for us to imagine what this all looked like. But talking about weight and talking about overburden. That temple was not made of timber, even if it was made of timber, it'd been, timber had been quite heavy. That temple was actually made of brick, stone, marble, marble columns, and even copper tiled roofs. And how do we know? Because we've got the evidence for them. Um, and what we've, what we've got there, we've got four oars. Now the oars um, come into, not four oars, um, four, um, 
Goff, what's the name of those things there? Where? The, uh, uh, the, the, the redder, four redders, sorry. Oh, right, yeah. I, I nearly got caught out then. You've got four, not four oars, you've got four redders. You've got um, two, on the, um, two on the stern and two on the aft. Two on the front and two on the uh, back of the vessel. Um, so that's four redders. Now we're going to see how these work. So you get this in your mind's eye. Look at the redder there. Okay. And we've actually got a reconstruction coming up. And that was a mistake I made with the lecture on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but we'll see the mistake I made in a short while. But before we actually get to this, look at this. Um, these are actually um, these are actually one of the four um, uh, vast electric water pumps which were set up to drain Lake Nimi. And there it is. An estimate of 1.4 billion cubic feet of water was re removed from the lake. Um, and it said, listening to this, Mussolini's fascist government uh, provided the resources that enabled excavators to drain Lake Nimi at the rate of about an inch per day. Um, it's probably, and, and then it would rain and it would go up again and all the rest of it, but eventually we've, we've got the lowering of the lake um, quite considerably. Because, um, because it's described that the vessels were 14 meters down, uh, we can only presume that the 14 meters down where the vessels is, is the area it was drained. The rest of the lake was not drained because that means that's why the other barge survived undetected. And it's good it survived undetected because if it had been raised um, with all the money from Mussolini's archaeologists, it would still have been burnt in 1944. Um, actually, I think that illustration there on the right is not Mussolini, the, uh, the pumping operations in, um, in at Lake Nimi. I think that illustration is actually from the center of Rome, but people can get it wrong. Um, again, moving over there. So um, here we go. This is a rather interesting one. And I got some text coming up, which I'll probably brush over and sample into. Um, diving bell. Now this is rather interesting. We've got various descriptions of, of um, the lake being sourced for material, salvage operations from the 14 onwards. <coughs> onwards. Um, but that's, that's a typical diving bell. Um, bas basically, a diving bell is simply um, <coughs> um, an upturned boat, um, a, thing, a wooden thing that is lined uh, to look like a bell. Um, sometimes it is actually made of metal, whatever way you want to describe it. It's something that needs to be weighted down to go down to wherever they need to get the bell down to. It's, it's basically a hollow out sphere uh, with, a little, um, with a little shelf so you can actually sit onto it and you've got candles and all up burning. You see um, um, sort of the journey to center of the earth and all um, thousand leagues and all the rest of it. They use diving bells and those types of things. So when they started using this in 1827 and when it gets down, they started to recover the odd, odd statue, the odd copper um, roof slate and you know the odd sort of uh, bronze and, and and so on and so on um, this is the first um, exploration and what they're actually finding as well they're, they're bringing up terracotta pipes and lead pipes and they're actually bringing up um, ho whole sections of mosaics as well so that brings us another complication it was also flawed like um, a roman palace so in other words you'd have had the decking you'd have had then that lined with probably lead and then directly on top of that to, to sort of um, keep the timbers from, um, from rotting. So you'd have had that lined with lead, then you'd have had various mortar levels, and then you'd have had a, a mosaic on top of that. Again, that leads to the weight on the vessel. This is a, this is a lot of lumber, a lot of stone. Um, so this is more evidence, and none of this again was removed before that. This is what they're this is what they're lifting, and there is some of the archaeological evidence: elaborate mosaics, some really fine elaborate mosaics as well. And that goes back. That takes me back to an earlier point. Maybe, maybe Caligula didn't build these vessels. He used them. He furnished them a bit more. Maybe, in fact, what I've mentioned earlier on was that um, he, he didn't really um, cause a financial uh, 
collapse in the Roman economy because of this, because they were already there. Uh, so in other words, he's being blamed for things he never did, which is a typical sort of scapegoating tactic. Tactic Because the Emperor Tiberius couldn't do anything wrong. The Emperor Tiberius was absolutely wonderful. He was a bloody despot. But we don't see that. Who we see as a despot is Caligula. So he has to be discredited every step of the way. But the finery and everything about the, the, the vessels shows the skill of Rome. Um, and again, the intricate nature of what we were trying to see there. Um, and also um, the sort of, um, there are descriptions again, I mentioned about um, gladiatorial competitions on there and the miniature Colosseum and all these other things as well. Can I just mention as well, the Romans were very garish. Did you know at some points in time, the Colosseum was filled with water right? And there used to be miniature galley battles actually on the water at the Colosseum. So, and that was in other emperors' reigns. So if you want to say about despots, it's everyone, right? And when, when you go to this, um, the, the engineering of actually having water on there and everything else is, is, is very eloquent. And if, if you, uh, to be honest with you, if you want to talk about garishness, we've got, we've got Buckingham Palace, we've got, um, we, we've got Windsor and all the rest of it. We still do it in our own society. So, um, I, I made a mistake. Um, I, I, on, on Tuesday, you've got four people doing a Skype class and I immediately say, oh, this is the prow or this is the prow or the after the vessel. And they say, no, it's not. And I said, oh yeah. Oh, and then one of them said, actually, it's one of the rudders. They've done a reconstruction where we're running rudders. So, so what we take you back is that's where the, um, these here, that's where the Roseman would have been, right? So this is, um, th this, this could be the, uh, um, this could be the prow or the aft rudder because there was four of them, right? That's a rudder there. Um, and these here are the ribs. Um, and they put some decking in there, a bit of a reconstruction. And why this, why this is rather interesting to us mm. um, is that um, they're doing a reconstruction of the mechanisms. Um, and then we had another discussion about this. It was said that, in fact, the rudder would have probably only moved a little bit because there was not much maneuverability. From the, from the evidence, from the evidential um, evidence, it showed that there was very little maneuverability in the rudder. Um, so it, it's, it's said about, um, here we go. Here's another word for you all sculling. Uh, you would, you would have used, you would have used the rudder slightly for maneuverability. Am I right or wrong there, Goff? Well, you don't really need the rudder when you've got the rowing, row, rowing, people rowing on either side. If you want to turn, you stop rowing one side and row the other. So yeah, it wouldn't, you wouldn't use that rudder like you would a normal ship's rudder. Exactly. <clears throat> um, because there's not much maneuverability. But then you go, you've got four rudders on this vessel. So, but it's on a lake, right? Somebody said, somebody said to me, they, I don't think they were listening. It was a li little bit like an Anne moment last week when she said, what was the picture all about? Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> didn't she at the end, didn't she ask the question, um, what, what, what did we just do? Anyway, so um, somebody, somebody in Electron, I think it was Tuesday, said, oh, um, when they built the vessel out at sea, how did they manage to get it inland? And they said, no, they actually built it there. They had a, they had a dry dock there. Um, so it would have been a dry dock created after they drained the lake. So obviously, um, when, the, when the water comes back into the lake, the vessel gets the buoyancy, and it's probably then that they actually build on top of it um, and, yeah. and they, they try to work out what's going on because if you build the if you build the structures on top of it whilst they're still in dry dock as the water comes in it's probably not going to it's not probably not going to rise itself so you might actually take it out a bit further on have pontoons out to it and then actually build the structures on top of it that's probably more like it and it's likely as well uh, and i probably think everybody listening to this would agree that i think the oarsmen were just for show because um, they wouldn't have gone far in that lake. And, and, and I know it would, have, it would have moved very sluggishly, very slowly. It does, doesn't have what, it, it, we, it's likely to add one bank of oars there. So it wouldn't have moved, it wouldn't have moved um, a great deal. So it's, it's a lot for show. And, and again, it, it's, 
but it does it does show one thing that the ingenuity of the building skills used for a vessel vessels that survived um 2000 years when the one is raised that they've still got in the lake there'll be probably a 2000th anniversary and the state of preservation that that will be but then again whether that's from the reign of caligula we don't know carrying on um so what they what they've done a little, i'm going to skirt over this a, a, a bit bit faster than um then we're going to come back to John Rome, and then I'm going to call it a day. But um, what it's basically saying is what they're what they're doing. They're they're making a reconstruction. And if you're looking at the re that's a reconstruction. That's just one keel, right? Um, and they they're building us on the northern shore of Lake Nemi, like the reconstruction. And they reckon that they, they will complete it one day. Um, how many years it'll be? They don't know. But what they've got is local. Um, they don't have state funding for this. So what they're doing, they're saying to local tradesmen, can we have some timber? And they're actually donating it. The, the keel itself in value in timber, right? Cost 50,000 um, euros. Um, I think that's probably about 50,000 pounds now, uh, but uh, 50,000 50, euros. And this, this wasn't too many years ago, just in timber alone. So you can imagine to to construct the whole vessel, you're talking about. They reckon it'll it'll cost about ten million pounds to actually construct one of these, and that's just the that's the timber itself. And they've then they've got to find the lead to um, line the bottom. But they're actually using oak, and they're not using cedar as originally used. But that's fine. Um, oak has a certain level of buoyancy, but probably a different buoyancy. And this is this is one of those things. Um, hang on a minute. Okay, don't, right. So, one thing they're doing again about the reconstruction, they're they're using um, they're using some uh, um, big companies to help them to sponsor them. They're getting local um, organisations to help them do it. Um, when it says when complete, the replica like the original will have uh, five keels, um, one hundred and forty oak frames, and two decks. So um, I think the frames, if we talk, is that another technical term for ribs, um, Goff? Oh, what? The word frame, 140 oak frames, is that a technical term for ribs? Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got a plank it as well. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot going on. So again, moving on, I just wanted to do this. Um, I just, and they're going to be building it in um, a number of stages. Um, so what um, I'm going to move you, I'm moving you around the screen a bit on my screen a bit more information on this okay um, obviously you can't you can't read this um, but this is with set within the, uh, the, the uniqueness of this <coughs> um, and it's saying Caligula's fondness for ships of his great uh, obsession I've already mentioned the one I've already mentioned the one that he had a vessel a galley um, across the Bay of Naples, and it had 10 banks of oars, but that's written by about Suetonius. But it writes with that vessel that it had brightly colored sails. Um, guests on, bo on board that one on the Bay of Naples could enjoy baths, um, dining, several banquet halls. Um, on that vessel on the Bay of, Bay of Naples, which probably sunk there somewhere, um, was uh, ming where you would mingle amongst flowering fruit trees as well. So you can imagine huge, huge pots with fruit trees. Um, and it's also saying, it's also saying as well on the, on the Bay of Bay Eye, um, um, it, they, they say um, that the three mile distance from um, one side of it to the other side, I'm not exactly sure where the Bay of Bay Eye is, but from one side to the next, which is three miles, it's said that. Um, that around 240 vessels were pontooned together um, for Caligula to ride from one side to the next, which I think is probably, um, they probably completely made, made that up and inflated it. But lots of scholars, it says in this, this as well, some scholars distrust historical accounts of Caligula's luxurious lifestyle. I'm one of them. Rejecting them as inf inflated by products of the public's resentment of the imperial excess. Even today, archaeologists can point to, um, it says, relatively few monuments that was substantiate 
um, the ancient reports of Caliglin um, exaggerants. So in other words, he built these structures, they were needed. Um, it goes, it says again, going into these notes as well, sort of guiding through this. Um, in 1895, um, an, antique, um, an antique dealer was allowed to dive on the vessel. Um, he located not one vessel, but two vessels and made a record of them. Because the holes were um, buried <coughs> in a sloping bed of mud in 1895, burdened by tons of marble, mosaics, bricks and tile, it was it ultimately decided that the only practical way to recover them was to lower the lake's water uh, level. And this wasn't done until the money was available um, under Mussolini's um, patronage. Um, and it, keep, it keeps on going, the information keeps on going. And by September 1929, the first ship, the one closest to the shore, was completely exposed. And by 1931, they were both exposed. Um, and it's very, it's very likely that the, the, reason, the reason why the vessels were first um, f located in the, 40, in the 1400s is because of this next document. Uh, as people were fishing on the lake, they would snag their hooks and their nets um, on something um, in the water. And what they would do, they would bring up big chunks of wood and various other things. Um, and it said that, um, it said that, they, that one or two bits and pieces were raised in the 1400s. In 1535, an, an, another Italian engineer, Francesco de Marchi, explored Lake Nebi using what could be called the first diving suit. Um, basically, a wooden drum bound with iron bands and fitted with a glass observation port. So in other words, a barrel with a, with a cut in it and a bit of glass in there. The drum covered only the diver's torso, leaving his legs and arms exposed from the elbow down. On one dive, to, um, in order to avoid entanglement, um, the Marquis descended without pants. <laughs> Having brought with him a modest quantity of bread and cheese, he was soon um, accosted by a school of small fish who began nibbling on both the breadcrumbs and himself. De Marchi claimed to have been able to um, cut, hammer, and tie lines from within the instruments. Basically, with all that said, it gets a bit confusing. He was able to um, raise one or two bits and pieces. Um, in 1827, an Anasio Fusconi became the third individual to explore Lake Nimi. Um, and it said that the, that the diving bell that had been invented by Edmund Halley was actually used there. Marble, um, mosaic, tessera, bricks, nails, various other adornments. Most of the finds were sold to noble Romans um, who wished to know more. So in other words, anything being raised from it wasn't being kept, was sort of, was sort of being sold on. Um, and by 1906, they're taking a real interest in what's there. So what we're going to do now, um, we're going to um, look at, um, we're going to look from October 1932, uh, which is the last bit of um, documentation that we've got here. Um, and we're going to look at this. In October 1932, the second ship was hauled um, ashore. Um, at the time, um, scientists knew, um, knew very little about um, excavating um, ships um, and knew very little about how to conserve waterlogged wood. Um, and I said, a few scientists, scientists that did were the Norwegians. As the vessels, as the vessels had come out, they, they decided to cover them with damp canvases to prevent rapid desiccation. And the advice of Norwegian researchers who had successfully conserved several Viking ships, including the Vasa, um, they decided that the best thing to do would be to cover the um, vessel with some kind of a resin solution. Um, and lucky these were raised on the lake, because if they were raised within a salt basin, like the Newport ship, they would have needed decades of conservation before they could even show them. Because they were submerged in water, um, fresh um, non-saline water was easy. 
Though the Nimi ships uh, were given modest cover, it became clear within a year that exposure to the elements and changes in temperature were causing rapid deterioration. So this is why they managed to get them under a hangar. They managed to get local people to um, give them funding um, to build this huge hangar in 1936. Now the downside of this is as follows. Um, so here we go back to John Roma. Then when the war came to Italy, the boats inside their hangars gave shelter to hundreds of <coughs> refugees. Finally, in 1944, after Allied aeroplanes had bombed them, some retreating Germans, German soldiers set fire to the two splendid boats. They were completely consumed by the flames. Only the splendid empty space inside their hangar still remains, along with two small models, a display of faded photographs and a vast anchor, um, a token of the boat's vast size. But we do have all the records that were kept. Um, however, it might not have been the Germans. That was John Romer's take on this. This is another take. On May the 28th, a German artillery post was established within 400 feet of the museum. According to museum guards, several marble columns within it were moved or broken in the days leading up to the fire. So here we go. An official report filed in Rome later that year described the tragedy as a willful act um, on the part of the German soldiers. However, a German editorial blamed the destruction of <coughs> American artillery fire. The true story of what happened that night will probably never be known. And it's a shame because there are still are people that would remember that event. But I don't know anyone who's actually been asked, asked about that. And as we go on, the only material untouched by the flames at Nimi were the bronzes stored in Rome. The archaeological site plans and technical drawings of the ships done by the Italian Navy, these documents were collected and published in 1940. Brilliant. Working, with the, working from the original drawings, U U Kelly's book, from when I, I should have said 1940, not 1930, um, they, they're able to draw up plans to build a new one, which they're doing. Um, obviously, today we don't have the resources of a Roman emperor to do it, so it'll be done over a period of time. Um, it will be done, but we'll probably have to wait. And when the, when the new reconstructed vessel is completed, we'll probably be raising the third one into the original hangars built for the ones destroyed on the 28th of May, 1944. Personally, I believe that um, it's, it's very likely that the, that the lead from the uh, vessels was taken, um, and maybe by the Germans, um, and then accidentally by artillery fire, the, um, the vessels are actually set alight or deliberate artillery fire by the Americans. But I don't think the truth will ever be known. Um, the lead would have been very useful for the war effort because it would have been on sheeting, uh, three layers of uh, lead sheeting. So, you, so the only, and the other point is, the only way to practically burn the vessel would have actually been to remove the sheeting in the first place. That's why none was found there. Um, and simply the vessel would have gone up just like a tinderbox. So what I'd like, what I'd like to do is um, just find out if there are any questions. And what I would like to show on the screen, if I may, um, is just a couple of images. Um, if you're able to see that there, there's, there's one of our vessel. You've, you've seen one version of that. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 And, and the sadness of the empty, um, <coughs> well, there we go. Oh, hang on. There it is. Basically, it says on that sign, quite ironic, a, a museum of the ancient Roman Navy. And you go in there. And what you do find is the saddest thing of all. And I come two empty aircraft hangars. But architecture of the air aircraft hangars are great. It, they, it, they were lit from above as well. Uh, the type of thing that um, would be would house the Mary Rose quite nicely. So what I'd like what I'd like to ask um, are there any questions? And I would like to say I see it on a serious note. If anyone if anyone's got any articles they would like to put in the next newsletter, um, then I would like to hear about them. 
um but you will get you'll get this one by next week and you'll get the notes and i'll be phoning everybody on monday right what i want is i want a contribution of everyone so karen have you got anything to say today no, that was very interesting. I knew Thanks. nothing about uh, Caligula other than his very bad press. So, uh, yeah, that was interesting to hear what he achieved. Thank you for that. What, what about you, Jim? I know you've got something to say. Uh -oh. By the way, Jim, can you put your hand up a minute? Put your hand up. Right. OK, Gillian, I'm going to ask a question from you next. Um, Gillian, any questions? No, it was really good today, Carl. Really good. You, you sound surprised. What about you, Gillian? <laughs> Not Gillian, Lynn. Oh, God, Lynn, Jim, Jim, Jim. Jim, Jim, Jim yeah, one. Um, yeah, I was going to say something and I forgot. Oh, I know what it was. Do you think perhaps the reason the ship had four or a number of keels is it never actually floated? It was actually sort of moored there, resting on its keels because it was so heavy. They didn't actually take float it anywhere or sail it anywhere. No, there's, there's, there's one problem with that. There's one problem with that. One, that the, the ships were found in 14 metres of water. Um, so... Ah, then, yeah, they're found in 14 metres of water, but during Roman times, it could have been a lot lower the water level. Um, it's unlikely, and the reason why it's unlikely, because of the water system that we found, was at the level of the height of the um, Lake Diana. That proved that the Romans had set up a water system. So it was... And the other thing as well is, it's it's water finds its own level it's not like the sea this water finds its own level so it's going to meet that level forever um, until there's a breach so you know the we, we know that these floated what happened with them isn't really because <coughs> we don't have video footage of that what about you goff well it, it wouldn't have been just moored because they had the rowing ports so obviously yes. it was going out into the lake and being rowed out there. So otherwise it wouldn't be there, would they? And they would have it's probably It's quite been... common to have four keels or even more on a, on a barge like that. For stability, yeah. But I was wondering why you think Caligula has this terrible reputation even now. Why is that? Because of the book? Or or what? Well, I, I think I think um I think if you if you look if you the, the, the biggest the biggest problem is the biggest problem is is that if I went through this list of Roman emperors, there are 121 of them. Uh, you see Augustus, he's the one that founds the Roman Empire, right? On your coins, you've got um, the the wording um, Caesar Augustus. So you're always a Caesar, right? Named after Julius Caesar, and you're always an Augustus, right? You're never a Tiberius because he was a second emperor. You're never a, a Caligula or a Germanicus. Right, um, because Claudius is the Claudius is the one who comes next. Claudius, to make Claudius's name, had to discredit Caligula, and he did a very good job of it. Job job at discrediting Caligula, and it, it was for his gain, because if Caligula had, if Caligula had actually set foot on Britain British so, soil, right. Um, Claudius would have never had the glory that he had by invading. What Claudius wanted to say was that I am as good as Julius Caesar. In fact, I am better than Julius Caesar, but I'm a very feeble, weak emperor. Um, he had to discredit everything to do with um, Caligula. Right? <coughs> and also the other thing as well is Claudius married Caligula's only surviving sister. So the bad publicity, then you've got Nero, but the bad publicity comes in a, a little bit later, right? The first person to really give him this really bad publicity to, that we know about is Suetonius. And the, the, the Roman emperors who are reigning in Suetonius's reign are Roman emperors like Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian. Um, and Nerva... Nerva um, lived and died natural causes at the age of 67. He only reigned for a year and a half, but that's that. Trajan reigned for 20 years, died a natural cause at the age of 64. Hadrian died a natural causes, reigned for 20 years. The, on coming from Hadrian, there was Antonius Pius, 19 years. Marcus Aurelius, a true great Roman emperor. Right? And then we have the madman, Commodus. And then we go then, then we go into... Um, 
a few years down the line, the 25th Roman Emperor is known as, um, uh, is known as Caracalla. We've already done Caracalla. He was an absolute nut job, right? It seems that through history, um, they've always wanted to discredit some of these Roman emperors, right? And the ones that they seem to like, they didn't discredit. So in other words, the great analogy is no joke. The great analogy is everyone's going to deride Theresa May, right? Um, Boris Johnson's going to be this, this hero for stopping thousands of people dying from this present thing at this minute, right? But the likes of uh, Tony Blair, um, nobody really thinks about Tony Blair, but all these different people have achieved different things. It's how people write about history is the way they're remembered. And the point is with this, the way the Caligula will always be remembered is the way he was first written about by these Roman writers like Suetonius and Dio Cassius. So we can't get away from that. But what we have done today is write some of those wrongs in your minds. Um, what I'm gonna do yes, is ask for Keith. You. I'm gonna ask Keith and I got two more things to say after that. Keith, have you got anything to say? Are you gonna ring me? If you don't ring Keith in two seconds. Um, okay, one, two, Keith. He's still there. Anyway, Keith, thanks for your contribution today. Um, oh, he's ringing. Hang on. Right, Keith, give it to us. Hello. Go on. Hello. Yeah, that was fine. That was fine. That was interesting. I enjoyed it. It wasn't rubbish this week. Oh, my God. That means it was crap. <laughs> all I'm going to say is goodbye to everybody and hopefully see you all next week. Okay, everybody says goodbye. Bye, Keith. I've got two Bye. little announcements then, Keith, and then we'll call it a day. So Keith says goodbye. Okay, cheers. Bye, everyone's, Keith. everyone's waving at you and stuff. So, um... I can't, can't see him. Yeah, I know you can. can but, 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 but anyway, just two things. <laughs> if, any of you want, if any of you wants to join the Zoom class on, um, on Saturday, I'll put the link up there. So it's just you, Joe, a goff, is it? For the ghost? Probably, yes. Right, okay. Yeah. I'll give it Good. a go, yeah. Give it a go. Um, I think what it what was, you liked, you liked Amy. Do I? My, my, my assistant on it, yeah. A Amy, Amy, oh, Amy. My assistant. <laughs> yes, she's my ghost walk assistant. She's the one that's, she's the one that frightens everybody on the ghost walks. All right. So, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to thank you for um, tonight, and I'm glad you've all enjoyed it, and um, tonight, today, and what I'm going to say is that I will... I will give you all a ring on Monday and I will hopefully see you all on Thursday. Uh, and if nobody has got anything else, nobody's got anything else to say, um, as I do with this technology, if everybody signs off in this order, so I know they got their technology, Karen, Jim, um, bye bye Jim, everyone. Goff and Keith. Bye so bye everyone, everyone sign off. Yeah. So bye. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and then everybody sign off in that order. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. I'll see you next week. Bye. Okay. Bye. bye. See you, bye. Karen. Bye. Yeah, um, bye, thanks. Keith, oh, well. Who's gone? Oh, and who's next? Karen, you're on. Okay. Right, off is gone. See you, Gillian. Okay, Karen, see you, Jim. Bye. See, see you, Gillian. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> I'll see you soon. Um, that's that. Um, I do believe somebody else is left there. But if they are, um, the elusive iPad person. So iPad person, whoever you are, um, I will see you next week. It's still you. Gillian, you're still there. I know. I'm going to switch it off now. I pressed the wrong button. Oh, you, you've pressed the wrong button all the time with me. Right, that's it. That's the recording. And hopefully everybody enjoyed this Caligula lecture. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>